data with the use of the type of neural network calls that historically consist on neural network. So I'm not sure um, uh, people are too much familiar with HCNS, how this is how we call it, and I will take a chance to this as an opportunity to give a better explanation of what this model is all about and how it models physical processes in general or time series data in particular. And, um, and towards the end goal, uh, we basically want to provide forecasts for, for wind power, uh, which is uh, a huge issue at the moment. So, uh, like Prof said, this work is supervised by Dr. Bukakaba, and uh, Prof. Kosi Raivate, and also uh, our collaborator, Dr. Ansi Kirok Zimmerman. And, um, and yeah, I'm a PhD there that's in South Africa, affiliated with Stellenbosch University. So, the main goal is just is basically to model is to build a sequence models, to build a sequence model. So how can I just a bit? Oh, you know, also the uh, uh, video panel, yeah. Oh, no. That's it again. Uh, no, you can probably put it at the bottom. Just yeah, just drag it to the bottom. Yeah, like something like that. Well, like I said at the beginning, we are interested in building sequence models. So we basically want to build the black box that you see on the screen, uh, where we want to build a model that's given a sequence, a returning a sequence of the same shape, or maybe of a variation. Which is basically a sequence to sequence mapping that you're able to do. And, uh, in the deep learning community, uh, there are different types of models that perform the same thing, but each of them is built with a different assumption in mind. We have uh, models like neural ODEs that harness the power of evolutionary differential equations together with neural nets to model rates of change. We have RNNs that capture a temporal correlation between events that can be far away from each other. We have CNNs, for example, that use uh, convolutional filter and transformers that basically extracts semantic or semantic correlation between uh, within a sequence. But our direction we are planning to head towards is more on the line of RNA because we are interested in causal description of events or causal relationship between different between different lags. Okay, but uh, all those models they all share the same interface, which is mapping a sequence to a sequence. And it's also important for us to kind of like clarify what we mean by sequential data here, even though I know this is not a new term here, but it is a, the spectrum of sequential data span discrete to continuous type. You know, the discrete type, which is like multiple, we have text graph and genomics and the continuous type, we have things like video feeds, robotics, time series, which is our interest also, which are with us. But um, our interest is more on the continuous sites uh, because um, that's how, that's how, why we also call it signal data, uh, because we not only as we, we are interested in the underlying notion of time, from which all those different types of sequential data are sampled from, but we, we, can't, we actually assume that the different data that we have are basically generated from a continuous physical process, and we want to model the physical process behind it. That is the whole, the main goal of this, of this research. Signals data uh, are everywhere, whether you look at audio waveforms to images, videos, EEG signals, and my favorite uh, dynamical systems, stock housing prices, time series coming from the energy sector, and so on. And um, the underlying notion of the temporal correlation is of interest. And uh, that's our, the, our main focus is towards uh, the application within the renewable energy sector. Uh, but there are several challenges that comes with doing such type of work. So uh, long-term dependencies is one of them. I think er everyone knows how much uh, machine learning model struggles when it comes to long context. Long con by context here, we, we mean the amount of information that can be encapsulated within a sequence. And um, for instance, when you talk about RNN, RNN models context by maintaining by building its memory through, through hidden units or through states that is maintained and updated through time. And there is, there is a lack of BFI understanding of how you can represent that memory. And we see how we represent memory and like the, the way RNN do represent memory and maintain. There's also an issue on the, on the sequence length, which refers to how long should be the sequence during the training in order to, for you to learn uh, 
uh, the only for your model to learn a meaningful representation of the history of what you are trying to study, it's often hard to kind of like set a, a prior, like there's not a clear theoretical guarantees or even practical guarantees of this is how large be your, 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 your the level of your sequence. But in the climate sector or in the renewable energy sector, for instance, sometimes you have hints that can tell you, that can give an idea about the prior. I think uh, if everyone might think of season seasonality because when you look at uh, cyclical partners you see within climate data, that can give a little indication on how long should your sequence for you to, uh, during your training time. And the third, another challenge is also to maintain online focus or updates, which means as more data comes into the system, how good is your prediction full time? This is also one issue that we, we are trying also to, to, to look at. And in terms of practical motivation, like I said at the beginning, we want to improve wind forecast technologies. It's true that there is a new channel of work out there that are trying to perform the same thing, but now we are trying to add a little bit of knowledge, you know, another, another way of rethinking the way, the thinking physical system. Because we, don't, uh, we shouldn't forget that wind forecast is part of climate, which is a physical system that guides or that drives the different dynamics. And, um, we are living in an era of energy crisis, and, uh, like the country like South Africa, for instance, which is which uh, electricity generation is predominantly predominantly coal based, and uh, unfortunately those type of resources are in decline, and therefore we have to head towards renewables uh, because they represent uh, least cost avenues for electricity generation. And the good news is uh, the country has very good wind, uh, wind velocity distribution, especially around the coastlines. And this makes it uh, effective or, or um, crucial or important for, for wind farm installation. And um, there's currently a lot of project uh, initiative put together by the government. I'm thinking of the RIE P, which stands for Renewable Independent Energy Power Procurement Program, which is an initiative put together by the government to encourage uh, the, the, the addition of renewables, uh, energy generated general from renewables to the existing uh, national grid. Uh, as we speak, there is a total of 37 operating wind farms across the country. Uh, however, the combined installed capacity is just about 3,500 megawatt, which is 20 times less than what coal uh, based uh, produce. So, but you know, the, the initiatives kept on going. And uh, with the data that we have available, available in, in, you know, when you look at wind speeds, velocity, air temperature, climatic pressure, there's a huge avenue to build models in order to help on that point. So what we aim to do is to provide forecasts, short-term and long -term. short term because the grid operator can make use of short-term forecasts for decisions on, on, on their grids. For instance, it can help optimize uh, dispatch decision, which means if they know how much Wind energy should be can be available in the short term. This can help them. They can help them. For instance, one way is to one way is to know uh, is to know how is to have a clear idea how to integrate it together with the existing energy, existing coal based energy, in order to before forwarding to transmission lines. And on the long term, for the, if it can help on on planning. Um, also, uh, like uh, government bodies or grid operators can have an idea whether they should work on um, maintaining of existing infrastructure or, or changing existing one because they have an idea of how much focus will be available in long run. By long run, we talk about 24 hours and plus, can be six, four to five days, and short term, we talk about a few hours, like four, six hours, and roughly a day. So, but at the end, this is still a mathematical problem because wind power prediction is basically an attempt to, to model a system that is complex. Complex because we have a large amount of, uh, complex because, uh, first of all, high dimensional because we have a high amount of variables interacting with one another, and complex because the interior structure between them is highly dynamic. And partly also because we are only able to see a part of the whole system, like when you measure. The, the, the wind, the temperature, is, is a chunk or fragments that is part of the whole system. You are, you are only able to see those levels, but there are a few, a lot more other that you are, you are not able to see. That's exactly what we are trying to do in this work, to reconstruct this for an observed variables. And but unfortunately, the intermittent nature of winds makes it very hard to predict, 
predicts the wind the wind speed fluctuates quite a lot. That's that's the reason why it's very difficult to integrate that type of energy within the grids. And um, the method that we are we are, that we have built and improved, which we call historical consistent NN, is has been first of all designed for for financial environments. It has never been applied into wind dynamics. That's what we are trying to do. The reason why we do so, we use it, is because we focus on both relationship. It not only uh, model dynamics of interest, it also reconstructs the variable that you cannot see, and uh, and both of them in a consistent in the same manner. But before we head out to data driven approaches that include RNA and transformers, lights. So that type of work used to be done by numerical weather prediction models, which use mathematical models of the atmosphere, ocean, and land uh, to predict the weather as a whole. They predict more than 100 variables as a whole, and they, but they rely on first principle models, practical derivations, deep and other processes, way before they're even able to be deployed on one geographical area. So it runs on supercomputer, it's very hard to, to use in practice. Uh, and therefore, uh, we have to try and look, up, look at the alternative. And uh, RNA initially work was built for such type of work because of its ability, theoretical ability to capture the complex and broad relationship between events. And, uh, but the whole game is to, the whole, the whole aim is to try and provide uh, reliable focus and by first of all, understanding the different patterns within the wind data. But before we get there, let's see a little bit in, pra in practice. In theory, it's a bit how RNA model a dynamical system in general. And it's good to mention that the dynamical system is not just a system that changes over time. Whether you look at apple that fall from the tree, this is a dynamical system. When you look at the way your brain functions, when you look at uh, the fluids flowing, those are all dynamical systems. We have uh, small, we have a small, small amount of variables. We have large, you may have a control amount of variables. But initially, how does that, how dynamical system is approached by RNA. It starts with the state space formation that you see on the top left here. So uh, in order to suppose at the beginning you are given a, a, a d-dimensional type of surface where d represents the amount of features that you have or the amount of variables that you have in one to model the dynamics. So the state space formation here allows you to describe a system with the use of two equations. You have the state function equations and the output equations. And the state function, the state function equations allows a mapping to the subsequent states with the use of their external signals. And the, the output equation is simply a is simply a function of the states. So and the goal is to find two parameterized functions f and g in such a way that you've managed to uh, handle the system in a reliable fashion. So RNN basically uses this modeling approach. That's why we have similarity between state space, state space models and RNN, and basically sets out a nonlinear mapping between two consecutive states. The, the, the nonlinearity here is basically the nonlinearity in the system is captured by this hyperbolic, uh, hyperbolic tangent. And, um, and in such a way that the output is simply a linear transformation of that state. That's simply how RNN works. And uh, what it does is trying to, and uh, it's trying to find is trying to find the uh, optimized matrices or objects A, B, C in such a way that the, the quadratic error between expected value and observed value is actually well, is, is the minimum minimum possible. So this equation here, this temporal equation here represents just what happened at one time point within RNA. And with an unfolding in time, now you get a chance to have the spatial realization with the architecture that you see below. So now this is not a representation of what we call the vanilla RNA. So which means now, which means when you observe the complicated dynamics that you see on, on your given time series data, RNA is trying to reconstruct that by, by its proposition of two components. We have the internal, internal dynamics component represented by the hidden units there that's actually progress over time. We also have the external driven components provided by the, by the external signals, whose contribution is encoded by this object P, in such a way that the output simply, uh, simply it's linear transformation of the, of the states. So, and uh, if the, the, you've trained hard long enough, 
theoretically, you should be able to provide a forecast that is reliable. But however, when you look when you look carefully at this architecture, we know that RNA suffer from many limitations. I mean, I think the main ones that are, that are always highlights are the vanishing exporting regions. But there's another one that we are trying to also pinpoint here. When you look at how RNA does the pass model, you can see that it relies on external signals to strengthen the, the, the internal, the hidden dynamics before producing an output. But on the, on the future side, on the future modeling side, there's an assumption of env environmental constants, which means we no longer need the external signals to provide forecast. This goes a little bit against how the physics uh, works because physics works whether you're in the past or in the future. So it's true that in, for a very short term, this can work, but in the long run, not only the philosophical approach of RNN is, is very short because of the lack of lack of, of external signals in the future, and we call this type of this type of inconsistency, temporal inconsistency across few past and future models. And this is what we are trying to solve. So if if we have, we had an idea of what the external signal will look in the future, well, I will have no problem. But unfortunately, those things are not available to us. We don't know what's coming in the future. So how do we solve this problem by solving the temporal inconsistency? That's exact, exactly where HCNN comes into play. So the philosophy of HCNN is basically to rethink the way we see the world. You know, RNN. Basically, you can see uh, it maps external signals to internal states. While ACNN thinks that the, we are only able to see a fragment of the world. That fragment of the world is what you see when you measure the variable that you, that you want to that you want to model with another. But in order to reconstruct that fragments or understand the dynamic of that fragments, according to ACNN. You have, you have to reconstruct all the, all the hidden variables, or at least part of them, and try to model them in the same manner because the physics acts on those variables the very same way. That's what, that's what HTML is trying to do by not mapping inputs to a state, but actually considering variables as part of your state. So the state's effect of HTML contains both the observables and the unobserved variables. And you can see it models them in the same manner when you look at this distribution. So, the state relation matrix here maps the, it helps in mapping the, the, the state at this time point to the next one, where within the state, you have both your observed variables and those we can't see in such a way that on the output side, you simply have like an extraction of those of the hidden states. So if, for instance, let's say you, I want to model the dynamics of 10 variables, they have a multi dimensional time, so let's say 10 of them. You can, set the, you can set the internal state to be to be dimension 100 in such a way that the first 10 variables represent your observables and the remaining 90 represent the unobserved variables. And this object here simply extract the first 10. So why is simply part of the state? It's simply the first D components of the state vector. This simplifies the way uh, we, we approach a physical system and it's consistent because now we no longer have this issue of absence of external signal during future model. And the problem becomes simply to find the A and S naught, S not being the initial states, states uh, vector that minimizes these distances between what you observe and what you predict. So, and uh, this is the architectural representation of RNA. It's all, it's all good until, until you want to start modeling in practice. And you'll find out that in HCNN is very difficult to, to model in practice. And, uh, but before we get there, you should be able to see that. HNN is just trying to find this function f. As opposed to RNN, which wants to try to find f and j. The model is quite simple. When even the order of the computation is reduced when you look at HNN. And, um, and uh, the learning task is simply, like I said, to find a and s not. In practice, HNN is difficult to, to train because they don't have any input signals. That's why we had to be a little bit um, have to change, you have to be inventive on the way you want to train it. We actually made use of a technique called architectural teacher force, which is a, bit diff a little bit different from the architectural teacher force now we all know. But in this case, we replace the output layer here by a target cluster that is given value zero. In that target cluster, at each, at each given time point, you compute the difference between the expectation, which comes from this, the state vector, 
and the observation of which comes from the ground truth in such a way that you can correct the state that was produced before. So this R here is called the refit factor. It's an error, it's an error fixing mechanism that allows you to avoid propagating or accumulating errors across the training time. So before you, before you do your state transition. So the difference between X and R is simply at the upper level, where at the upper part of R is simply the difference between what comes out of the cluster, which is the difference between expectation of observations and what comes from the upper part of, this, of the state vector, which is what you see here. And in the end, you find that that this difference is basically your ground truth. So when you model, when you model that across different time points, you will see that as you go, the model is, is actually forced to reduce the gap between what you observe and what you've predicted. That's how we managed to fix our, uh, to uh, basically fix our, uh, to uh, get our error group close to zero during macro validation parameter updates. And you can see that the is consistent. But we also developed three different improvement methods in order to even improve the, the predictive power of HCMM. So with the, because we have this problem of long memory. One technique is called partial digital forcing. Another one is called large bars. Another one is called NSC information. So the partial digital forcing simply works by replacing the output cluster by a dropout filter that is given in probability, which means at each given time, the cluster, the, the, the output here is basically endowed with a dropout filter where occasionally or randomly the model suppresses the output coming from here. This is going to enforce the system to rely on, the external, on its internal expectation, which means S is basically going to, is going to be basically equal to R. Across the, across the mass model. And uh, the second one is called large pass. It comes from the fact that sometimes you have to model large dynamic system, which means you have, you have observed 100 variables at the same time. Therefore, we need to have very large state transition metrics. And what we've noticed is that this matrix vector computation here sometimes causes an information overload. This, this thing sometimes blow up to infinity. Therefore, we need to do something about that. And um, what we need is basically to specify the metrics A in such a way that the model is able to, is able to sense valuable information across different states in such a way that we can still have a reliable expectation at the end. And we control the sparsity in an empirical fashion by simply making it inversely proportional to the dimensionality of the state vector. As you see, that's how we control our capacity. The last one is an LSTM formation of ECA, where we wanted to make use of two things the information coming from the digital forcing and the information coming from the state space transition. It has been built as in an analogous fashion with LSTM. It's, it's a little bit engineered the way we, we, we build it because we look at when you look at this equation here, we consider that. We consider three switches, where on the one switch you basically what you basically have the output of the digital forcing, and on the other switch you have you have basically the output of the state strong of the linear transition. How sometimes you will you find out that you want to use you want to use we want to use both of them, but at the, at the moment we only use one of them, which is the contribution from this side. You can see if this switch here have the value one, I mean the switch works in the in a zero sum game fashion, which means when one is one, another one is going to be zero. You can see if the switch one is equal to zero, therefore we have the normal nonlinear state transition that I've seen uh, shown already. And when the switch number one is equal to one, then we simply have the output of teacher forcing propagating forward. So how do we harness the power of both type of information? Well, we use a diagonal matrix D. That that is that basically uh, that basically replace those switches here. And you can see that initially we start with the identity matrix, which is a diagonal matrix with one on the diagonals, and we make sure that all, all the off diagonal elements are zero. When you look carefully at the, at the diagonal matrix here, you can see that when it's all one on the diagonal, you can see that uh, this part gets to zero, and you have the normal nonlinear set of conditions. And the other way around, when the diagonal elements are all zero, well, this won't disappear. You only have this one. And the beautiful thing that we did here was to make the diagonal matrix learn learnable. 
but by making sure that the values on the diagonal are all clamped between zero and one, and the off diagonals are constrained to all zeros. So you only learn what is in the diagonals and the values are clamped between zero and one. This is to make sure that we have both contribution of, of, the, of the normal typical part and the non-linear structure. And this is the equivalent architecture that we built. And the end is fantastic to watch the distribution of the ways that you have in diagonals. So all I mean, uh, for the three, those three different uh, profile mod models that we built, we actually put everything together in the paper that was released in the, in the International Conference of Time Series and Forecasting in, in May 2022. And uh, in order to test the effectiveness of our method, we basically use a deterministic chaotic system. Deterministic because we know all the variables that are in the system, a chaotic because the system is very sensitive to initial conditions. We try to solve those three systems and try to inform the dynamics. I'm pretty sure most of you have seen the Lorentz system, which is one of the famous uh, uh, deterministic chaotic system. We solved this system and got the trajectories of X, Y, and Z, and now trying to train our model in order to reconstruct those trajectories. And for those who have ever dealt with Lorentz system, we see that for just a small change by initial condition of X, Y, and Z, the attractor's coefficient it becomes a bit different. So what you see on the left here is actually the, the 3D view of the attractors. And what you see here is simply the 2D views of it, where you basically take the, on the x-axis you have a time scale, on the y-axis you have the actual values. And the green, yellow, the green, red, and, and blue curve represent x, y, and z. So we basically, like I said, we solved the system, generated time series out of it around 2,000 time steps. What we did is like to try and train our models on the first 1,500 and predict the 500, the remaining 500. So we did that, and uh, not only for ACNS and the improvement method, but also for RNN and also for ACN, all trained to their best potential. And on average, we were able to see that most models were able to capture the, the dynamics for the long run. But something with time series is that the visual representation can be sometimes misleading. That's why it's important to look at a summary table in order to see which one of the models are the superior ones. And after running enough simulation, we saw that the HNM with positive forcing was able to outperform everything else. Our, our vanilla HNN was able to outperform our vanilla RNA, and our LSTM formulation was able to outperform its own with its own part in the scene. And uh, we knew that it, it would be uh, kind of like questions around how can you ensure that your results are reproducible. What we did is that we put together an ensemble computation. An ensemble computation simply means that we put together maybe 10 ensemble, 10 HNM models at the same time, and we train them simultaneously and we watch the dynamics. What you see on the, on the down here, on the gray curves, which you can barely see, represent the actual ensemble members the solution of the ensemble members. You can see for the 10 ensemble members that we use, because all of them were mostly able to catch the trajectories on the, on the, during the forecast horizon. And uh, another thing that we did in order to summarize the result of the ensemble is to take the medians, the point forecast median of each of them. It's represented by the blue dot curve. You can see it basically aligned with the solid lines, which will reach the ground to data, which actually gives us enough Computing such we are leading towards the right direction. This is one part for the deterministic for the deterministic part. But now for the real world part, now we set out to do the same project, the same task on wind power forecasting. We got data from from the wind atlas of African project where you have a set of nineteen wind mass measurements spread out across the country. You can see them with the, those little blue icons. And those mass measurements capture every 10 minutes since 2010, different variables like the wind speed, direction, skin temperature, and so on. And um, we actually try to, 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 uh, to actually do modeling, model those kind of variables. In, in our case, we use a wind speed and direction. And direction refers to the wind angle, which means the angle of the direction of the wind. And trading with such type of data is quite difficult. Therefore, we had to go through a data process instead, which I'll explain it. Um, yeah, and uh, and to mention again, for the Lorentz system, 
which train the ACNN in a, in a mode that we call fully enfolded mode, which means we take the whole of the 1,500 time steps, we, get, we use as our, our only one sequence, and we train our model with it, and we're able to, to do the forecast. But for the, for the real world wins data, where you have about four years of, of the information, and record it every the time of it is 10 minutes, you cannot do such things. You're gonna accumulate so much. You're gonna first work very hard and long to train. You're gonna accumulate so much, so much error throughout the training. We basically come with what we call the average mode, where we set a fixed and folding length for architecture and we deploy it across different parts of, of the series. This is what the transformer would do, for instance. You look at every part of the series and you're trying to see how which are the ones that are similar to what is expected to predict. That's why we glad that transformers when it comes to time series are simply performing a similarity analysis. So for the short term, we decided to provide forecasts for four hours, which is basically 24 time step, the time grid being 10 minutes. For the long term, we provide 24 hours and more for a time grid being one hour. And we divided our models into low wind regime, which means less than 12 meters per second. And large and higher wind regime, which is loud, is what we're doing. Second thing, yeah. No. Before we head out to training, we basically transform our data, which means winds and direction, into wind vector to avoid singularity issues around zero degree and 360 degrees. And we also made use of uh, something that really, really uh, improved our, 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 uh, our training, the whole training process which was using the time index as external variables, because the time index is available both in the past and both in the future. The time index simply refers to the time of the day. You can see, for instance, for the recording that was made at 1 a.m., for instance, out of the day, which lasts 24 hours, you, you map that time index into a circle in order to extract cost and side functions. It's a little bit what you guys do when you use positional encoding. So, and uh, the T here represents the time of the day, and big T represents the actual period, the 24 hours thing. And since we know that tomorrow is going to be 24 hours, next week, Thursday is always going to be 24 hours, therefore we can take the risk of including them as part of our external variable because they are both available both in the past and the future. And we even set a matrix that's going to learn the contribution of time index throughout the modeling. This leads to a modification of our architecture where you can now see a a, a new guy we added, which is a B times UT, index times the contribution matrix of it. Now, to come into the results, that what you see now is the four hour forecasts, not four hour forecast, four hours using 10 minutes in the internal. This is the ACN plot, and together with the true data, true data is for orange, ACN is blue. On the right hand side, you can see how one is able to capture the transition between zero and 60 degrees you know, on the wind direction. The wind direction is critically helpful because if the wind or the grip operator knows the direction of the wind for the next 24 hours, they can get, this can give them time to adjust the blades in order to capture the maximum amount of wind. That process that is called yawning. Now, when we put everything together, which means we include earning, we include LSTM, this is what we got there. But looking at the summary table, we can also see again that the oxygen process is still the winner method. Sometimes it outperforms, it does two times, three times as much as what LSCM does and RNN does in terms of uh, generation error on both with low, low winds and high wind regime. So, and uh, this is what we perform. And now the next step, hopefully we are, uh, we are convinced on how we use HNN to model the physics behind the, wind, behind the wind dynamics. And now the next step would be to see how the model can generalize across space and time, especially space, because we know that the physics is the same across the whole countries, across the different locations. And um, is it possible that our models can also perform very well when we change from one location, from one location to the other, from the north to the south, and from the east to the west? Another question which is vital for engineers is, how long can you use your model when it's on, in production before it's learned? It's like, for instance, GPT-4 is already published. How long can we use it and so it means additional return? That's one question we are aiming to solve. We've already got some results about that, and we're able to produce a six days ahead forecast. Just for context, uh, Google recently published a paper, a graph cast model, which is able to provide a 10 days ahead forecast. And we, we are currently sitting on a six days ahead forecast. What you can see now, if we even added 
the wind speed at different heights, reaching 20 and 60 meters, together with the direction and the air temperature. And using the ensemble computation fashion, this is the focus that we obtain. See that um, the dotted red line represents the medians of all the focus. You can see how it aligns well with the, with the true data. Day one, day two, and day three. And to mention that, how do we do the forecast? Like we give our models a context window of, let's say, 48 hours. And when it's given 48 hours, it produces 24 hours forecast in the future. And every six hours, we, we, we improve the update. Like in the next six hours, again, we give the model the past, the past 48, hour, 48 hours of observations instead of to shoot 24 hours again in the future. This is day one, day two, day three. You can see as, as day progresses, the model is a bit is losing uh, the stability focus, which makes sense. But you can see that up to day six, you will see able to to have something that is reliable that could be used. So this is how far we've we've uh, we've reached. And uh, thank you. Uh, those are the references. And just to mention that for the wind for the wind problem, we also released a paper uh, last December and uh, on wind power prediction in the turbines. And those are open access and available. Everyone to look at it. So we are currently finalizing everything and with the help of the lab. We want to also make the code uh, accessible to the public in such a way that people can use and report anything on the data processing part and also on the model part. So uh, thank you. Right. Uh, thank you. I guess uh, you can I guess stop sharing.